Are you Scottish? What makes you Scottish? Scotland's story isn't carved in stone. It's written in blood. Beneath the mist and mountains lies a genetic memory older than clans, older than Celts, older even than the word Scotland itself. For centuries, we thought we knew where the Scots came from. Proud Celtic roots, a streak of Viking daring, maybe a trace of Roman wanderers. But DNA has shattered that myth. You're watching Stone and Bone, where we decode the past written in our DNA. Tap. Subscribe if you believe that blood remembers what history forgets. Because what's hidden inside Scotland's genes will change everything you thought you knew about who the Scots truly are. 12,000 years ago, Scotland was a frozen wilderness. No forests, no people. Just a wasteland of ice, stone, and silence. But when the glaciers began to melt, life returned. Forests crept north. Rivers carved through rock, and across a now-vanished land called Doggerland, a vast plain that once connected Britain to Europe. The first humans followed the thaw. They were hunters, moving with the herds, small bands carrying flint tools, bone spears, and fire in their hands. They were not Celts. They were not fair-skinned Highlanders. DNA reconstructions, like that of Cheddar Man, Britain's oldest known human, revealed dark skin blue eyes, and tightly curled hair. These Mesolithic foragers fished, hunted, and lived along Scotland's coasts more than 10,000 years ago. And somehow, their DNA survived. Genetic studies show that traces of those Ice Age people still exist in remote parts of the highlands and islands, preserved by isolation, passed down through unbroken lines for millennia. While Europe's open plains became crossroads of conquest, Scotland's rugged landscape became a vault. Its mountains and islands guarded ancient blood like stone shields. And even now, in the faces of those who call these lands home, the oldest story of Europe still flickers quietly beneath the skin. But time never stands still. And the next wave that reached Scotland wouldn't just leave an imprint. It would rewrite the gene pool forever. Around 4,500 years ago, Strangers came from across the sea. They carried metal, livestock, and pottery shaped like bells. Archaeologists call them the Beaker People. They brought new tools, new traditions, and new DNA. A landmark 2018 study in Nature revealed that their arrival replaced up to 90% of Britain's male lineages in just a few centuries. Entire bloodlines gone, others absorbed, a silent genetic revolution. This was no invasion of armies. It was an invasion of generations. Families blended, cultures merged, the old world dissolved into the new. And through it all, the land itself recorded every change. The Beaker men carried the R1B haplogroup, still found in about 70% of Scottish men today, a living echo of that Bronze Age transformation. Yet the women's story is different. Their mitochondrial DNA, the maternal line, remained largely unchanged. Even as new fathers arrived, the old mother's blood endured. Two histories, one erased, one eternal, woven together into a single nation. If you discovered your ancestors were both the conquerors and the conquered, would that change how you see your heritage? Because for Scotland, it did. The land that once preserved ancient blood had now become a cauldron of new identity. And from that crucible, Something fierce and untamed was about to rise. People who painted their bodies for war and terrified an empire. They were the ghosts of the North. To the Romans, they were Picti, the painted people. Fierce, elusive, and impossible to conquer. For centuries, historians wondered who they truly were. Invaders from the sea, a lost tribe, a people who vanished, but DNA has answered what legend could not. Recent studies from burial sites like London Lynx in Fife and Ballantory in the Highlands reveal that the Picts weren't foreigners at all. They were descendants of Scotland's earliest inhabitants, children of the Ice Age and the Beaker world combined. They didn't disappear, they evolved. When Gaelic language and culture spread from the West, the Picts didn't die out, they merged into it. 
Their names changed, their stories blurred, but their genes lived on in the Highlands, woven invisibly into the blood of those who came after. The next time you see a Highland face, strong, pale-eyed, proud, remember, behind it may lie the DNA of warriors who once painted themselves blue and fought beneath northern skies, defying the greatest empire the world had ever known. But Rome's legions were coming anyway, and what they brought wasn't just war. It was a world's worth of blood. By the first century CE, the empire had reached the edge of everything it knew. Here, beyond the walls of civilization, lay a land they called Caledonia. Wild, cold, unconquerable. The Romans built Hadrian's Wall to mark the end of their world, but even walls can't stop blood from flowing. For though Rome never tamed Scotland, it still left its mark. The legions stationed in Britain weren't only Italian. They came from across the empire, from Spain, Syria, North Africa, the Balkans. Some served for years along the frontier. Some married local women. And in those quiet unions at the edge of empire, a few strands of Mediterranean and Middle Eastern DNA slipped north into Scotland's gene pool. Those markers are faint now. Tiny percentages scattered through lowland families, but they exist. Proof that Rome's reach was not just political, it was biological. Rome soldiers built roads, forts, and walls. But their true legacy lies not in stone. It lies in the children, born in the shadow of empire. And when the legions withdrew, Scotland didn't grow quieter. It grew stranger. Because from the sea, another force was gathering, one that wouldn't just touch the land. It would take root in it. The sea was their road, and the wind was their ally. In the late 8th century, the silence of Scotland's northern shores was broken by the creak of longships and the cry of ravens. The Vikings had arrived. They came first as raiders, but they stayed as settlers. Unlike the Romans, they didn't just build forts and leave. They built homes. They took wives, raised children, and wove their language into the land itself. On the islands of Orkney and Shetland, their presence was so complete that modern DNA shows over 60% of male lineages are still Norse in origin, higher than in parts of Norway itself. That's not a trace, that's a legacy. From these northern islands, the Norse influence spread to the Hebrides, Argyll, and the western coastlines. Their words shaped place names, Wick, Lerwick, Stornoway, while their blood mixed into the veins of Highland families. Later came the Normans, descendants of Vikings who had settled in France. They didn't arrive in longships, but in royal courts, through alliances and marriage. Names like Bruce, Stuart, and Sinclair carry that same Norse spark, hidden behind the polish of French titles. The Vikings left more than sagas. They left faces, names, and Y chromosomes that still whisper across the islands. Scotland didn't just survive the Viking Age, it inherited it. But while Norse blood reshaped the North, another force was taking hold within. Something deeper than conquest, older than kingdoms, and bound not by battle, but by belonging. For centuries, Scotland's clans were thought to be great families, each name a lineage stretching back to a single ancestor. A clan was blood. It was identity. It was history. But DNA tells a more complicated story. Take the McDonald's. Genetic testing shows that men with that surname often carry entirely different Y chromosomes. They weren't all kin. They were allies. Families who swore loyalty to a name, a banner, a chief. In times of war or exile, taking the clan's name meant survival. Now compare them to the Campbells. Their DNA traces back to one dominant male ancestor. True lineage in its purest form. One founder, many descendants, a dynasty written into chromosomes. So the clans we celebrate today were not always families by blood, but by choice. Communities woven together through loyalty, politics, and survival. The tartan that unites them may not tell the story of shared DNA, but it tells the story of shared destiny. If DNA proved your clan name wasn't really tied to your blood, would that matter to you? Or is belonging about more than genetics?
And yet, in places where geography guarded the people, on islands like Lewis, Island, and the windswept coasts of the north, something remarkable happened. Their isolation preserved DNA sequences found nowhere else in Europe. Genetic fossils of the Ice Age, the Bronze Age, and the Viking Era all carried quietly within living Scots. If DNA is memory, then Scotland's is photographic. It remembers every wave that reached its shores and every soul that refused to leave them. But within that memory lie stranger threads still, origins that stretch far beyond Europe, crossing mountains, deserts, and frozen steppe. And they're hidden in the unlikeliest of places, inside Scottish blood itself. Not all of Scotland's genes come from the north, Hidden in a few family lines are origins that seem impossible. DNA markers from North Africa, the Middle East, and even Siberia. They make up less than 1% of the Scottish genome, but they exist. Proof that no land, no matter how remote, is ever truly isolated. Some of these markers may trace back to Roman soldiers from Syria or North Africa who served along Hadrian's Wall. Others may have arrived through Viking trade routes that stretched from the Arctic to the Silk Road. A single traveler, a captured slave, a wandering merchant. One chance encounter was enough to carry a fragment of foreign blood into a highland gene line that would last a thousand years. Picture this, a fisherman on Lewis, whose DNA carries a spark that began beneath Saharan sun a crofter in the highlands whose ancient ancestor once rode with nomads across the Siberian steppe. These are not myths, they are molecules, proof that even at the edge of the world, the world found its way in. But those genes didn't just survive the centuries, they adapted. And in the people of Scotland today, the past still breathes in color, complexion, and character. Walk through any Scottish town and you'll see it the unmistakable flame of red hair. Only about 1 or 2% of the world has it. But in Scotland, it burns bright in 13% of the population, the highest anywhere on Earth. That fiery hue comes from a mutation in the MC1R gene. It once gave an evolutionary advantage, helping people absorb sunlight in northern latitudes, where the sky stays gray for most of the year. But the same gene that brings the glow of copper also brings a price greater sensitivity to pain, and a higher risk of skin cancer. Scotland's genes are a record of adaptation, proof that survival always demands trade-offs, and isolation amplified those differences. Rare genetic traits, like certain types of cystic fibrosis and autoimmune disorders, appear here more often than in the rest of Europe. A genetic echo of centuries spent in close-knit communities, sheltered by mountains and sea. Every freckle, every fair complexion, Every shade of red hair is more than a feature. It's an inheritance. The living evidence that Scotland's DNA is not just ancient. It's alive. But blood doesn't stay still. And the next chapter of Scotland's story would be written far from its shores. The Highland Clearances. Famine. Opportunity. Each wave carried Scots across the seas to Canada, America, Australia, New Zealand, taking their stories and their DNA with them. More than 30 million people today claim Scottish ancestry in the Appalachians, in Nova Scotia, in the far reaches of the Southern Hemisphere. Genetic signatures link modern families back to Highland Glens and Island Villages. The migration was not just cultural, it was biological. Modern testing can trace those roots with uncanny precision. Someone in Texas might find their DNA matches the Isle of Skye. A family in Nova Scotia might share ancestry with crofters from Islay. Scotland's genetic fingerprint is so distinct that it still stands out across oceans and centuries. The Scots didn't leave their homeland behind. They took it with them. Every cell, every strand of DNA, carrying fragments of peat bog and heather, storm and stone. Scotland may be small, but its blood runs global. Scotland's DNA is not a straight line. It's a tapestry, a weave of ice and fire, invasion and endurance. Every cell remembers something the history books forgot. 
It remembers the foragers who followed the melting ice, the beaker folk who brought bronze and new blood, the painted warriors who defied Rome, the Vikings who came with wind and fire, and the wanderers whose footsteps began half a world away. All of them still live here, inside the faces of modern Scots and within the millions around the world who carry their blood. You've been watching Stone and Bone, where we decode the past written in our DNA. Tap subscribe if you believe that blood remembers, and tell me in the comments which part of this story changed the way you see your ancestry. Because in the end, Scotland isn't just a place. It's a legacy carried in every heartbeat, and as long as that blood flows, the story never truly ends.